a land long considered geologically unbreakable, Australia has just given up its biggest secret. Scientists have verified two vast volcanic chambers, each more than 50 kilometers wide, hidden beneath what everyone thought was stable ground. The discovery instantly shattered every textbook assumption about the continent's safety. If ancient volcanoes of this size escaped detection until now, what else lies beneath our feet? And how do we even know it is safe? Inside a climate-controlled lab, racks of muon detectors stand shoulder to shoulder, each one tuned to catch the faintest traces of cosmic particles streaming through the Earth. The lead scientist, Dr. Lena Hargreaves, checks a bank of monitors as raw data flows in. Streams of numbers measure subatomic collisions and density shifts deep underground. The array, spanning nearly a square kilometer, collects billions of data points each week. This is not a science fiction experiment. It is particle-based imaging at its most ambitious, mapping the hidden world below with the help of muons, particles produced when cosmic rays hit the atmosphere and capable of passing through kilometers of solid rock. Analysts first noticed something strange when the panel's resolution settings flagged a massive density deficit, an area where fewer muons were being absorbed than expected. At first, the spike in the data looked like a software glitch. Noise filter thresholds had been tripped before, usually by thunderstorms or solar flares. But this anomaly persisted across multiple data packets and detector banks. The flagged segment covered an area far larger than any known geological structure in the region. With each recalibration, the statistical jump only grew sharper. Algorithms designed to weed out instrument error could not explain the pattern. The team ran simulations, swapped out hardware, and even rebooted the array. Still, the anomaly held steady a vast, low-density region that defied every baseline model. For the first time, the muon tomography lead realized the detectors were not malfunctioning. Something massive, buried deep beneath the continent, was bending the rules of what should be possible. Out on the open plains, a network of seismic sensors listens for vibrations deep beneath the surface. Dr. Sanjay Rao, head of the Seismic Array Task Force, checks the incoming waveforms, each spike and dip, a clue to what lies below. When a low-velocity zone appeared on the first cross-section, it drew immediate attention. Seismic waves, which usually speed through solid rock, slowed dramatically as they crossed a shadowy region nearly 20 kilometers down. The anomaly's outline matched the muon tomography results almost exactly, both in depth and in lateral spread. It was not a glitch. Multiple arrays spaced at intervals of five kilometers picked up the same signal. The shadow stretched for more than 50 kilometers, echoing the dimensions flagged by the particle detectors. Time-stamped records from different stations showed the same pattern, energy waves bending and scattering as they passed through the low-density pocket. The velocity drop was too sharp to be explained by sediment or groundwater. Only a massive void or a chamber filled with molten material could create such a pronounced effect. Within days, the seismic data was independently verified by a second team working hundreds of kilometers away. The match between the two methods, muon imaging and seismic velocity mapping, left little room for doubt. What started as a suspected hardware error had become a confirmed geological anomaly. The findings triggered an urgent call for a national task force setting the stage for the first full-scale interpretation of this hidden structure's true nature. Dr. Miriam Leung stands over a table covered in maps, her finger tracing the outline of the Australian continent. She specializes in craton geology, the study of Earth's oldest and most stable crust. Australia's craton is a relic from the Archean and Proterozoic eras a block of crust that has resisted deformation for billions of years. Its rocks are dense, cold, and thick, forming a foundation that geologists have long considered immune to the kind of deep molten upheaval seen elsewhere in the world. The last volcanic eruptions on this landmass took place 5,000 years ago in the newer Volcanics province, and even those were minor compared to the explosive histories of places like Indonesia, 
or the Pacific Ring of Fire. Most of Australia's surface has remained undisturbed for millions of years, with no signs of recent magmatic activity, no geothermal hotspots, and only the faintest traces of ancient volcanic fields now worn down by time. Crucially, the, the Craton's stability has shaped every geological model and hazard map for the continent. For decades, textbooks have described Australia as tectonically quiet, a region where the crust is too thick and cool for magma to rise in significant volumes. Seismic surveys and heat flow measurements have reinforced this belief, showing little evidence of the kind of dynamic forces that drive volcanism elsewhere. The expectation, shared by generations of geologists, is that Australia should be the last place on Earth to hide a pair of massive volcanic structures. Yet the new data refuses to fit this picture, leaving researchers like Dr. Leung searching for explanations that go beyond the established rules of plate tectonics. The contradiction between the continent's ancient, rigid foundation and the evidence of something vast and molten below has thrown the scientific community into a state of genuine confusion. Deep beneath the Australian continent, the question of what powers these massive underground structures divides the research teams. Some point to the possibility of a mantle plume, a column of hot rock rising from the planet's lower mantle, far deeper than most volcanic systems ever reach. If true, this would mean the source lies more than 2,500 kilometers beneath the surface, tapping into a region geologists once considered out of reach for any known volcanic process. To test this, teams propose a battery of follow-up studies. Isotope geochemistry offers one path. By collecting rock and groundwater samples from boreholes near the anomaly, scientists can measure ratios of helium and other noble gases looking for signatures that match deep mantle origins. High-resolution seismic tomography is also on the table, with plans to deploy denser sensor arrays and run imaging algorithms capable of resolving structures at depths approaching 100 kilometers. The goal is to map the shape and movement of material feeding these chambers, searching for evidence of a plume's thermal fingerprint. Not everyone is convinced, Dr. Leung, the crustal geologist, cautions that Australia's thick, ancient crust may have acted as a barrier for millions of years, preventing even the most persistent upwellings from breaking through. She argues that the anomaly could be a relic, an ancient chamber long since frozen, its heat and gases now locked away. The debate is more than academic. If the plume theory holds, the implications for volcanic hazard assessment are profound. The team submits a funding request for isotope labs and expanded seismic coverage, knowing that without direct evidence, the true nature of these structures and any risk they might pose will remain uncertain. Dr. Bwim Dr. Nia Patel the hazard modeling lead stands at the center of a digital operation suite where simulation outputs flicker across a wall of screens. Her team feeds the latest seismic and density data into thermal models, searching for signs of magmatic heat. The numbers tell a story that is difficult to ignore. Groundwater temperature probes near the anomaly show a persistent elevation. Readings hover at 29.6 degrees Celsius nearly four degrees Celsius above the regional baseline. In the deeper aquifers, the difference widens to six degrees Celsius, a signal too large to dismiss as seasonal fluctuation or equipment drift. Simulation, atmospheric data arrives from a network of remote sensors. Dr. Tillard, Dr. Patel's colleague, atmospheric scientist, Dr. Marka Kali, Dr. Marcus Liu, reviews the carbon dioxide measurements. Baseline carbon dioxide in the area has long averaged 420 parts per million, but recent samples show spikes reaching 470 parts per million. The pattern is patchy, but the highest values cluster along a fault line above the map chamber. Isotopic analysis points to a magmatic source, an unusual ratio of helium-3 to helium-4, a fingerprint rarely found outside active volcanic regions. Magmatic simulation teams 
run scenario after scenario. They model the effect of a sudden pressure release from the chamber, mapping how an eruption's thermal pulse would propagate through the crust. The worst-case simulation shows a rapid temperature surge. Surface soils could heat by 15 degrees Celsius within hours, enough to vaporize shallow groundwater and drive steam vents across a 30-kilometer radius. The models predict that if magma were to breach the surface, an ash column could reach 12 kilometers in less than 40 minutes. Prevailing winds would carry fine ash eastward, intersecting major domestic flight corridors within two hours. Worst, ash aviation safety expert Dr. Dr. Helen Kwan overlays the plume dispersion model onto real-time flight maps. She traces a line from the projected vent to the nearest airport, noting that a plume reaching 10,000 meters would force the closure of at least three regional airfields. International flights between Sydney and Singapore would need to divert south, adding hours to travel times. The window for issuing flight advisories shrinks to less than 90 minutes once plume detection systems trigger an alert. Airfields, the hazard modeling team quantifies risk in stark terms. A modest eruption, classified as Volcanic Explosivity Index 3, could deposit up to 5 centimeters of ash across the nearest towns within 12 hours. Power substations and water treatment plants lie inside the projected fallout zone. At the upper end, a volcanic explosivity index 5 event would disrupt air traffic across the eastern seaboard for days, grounding more than 400 flights and affecting tens of thousands of passengers. Simulations estimate a 30% probability of electrical grid disruption if ash accumulates on high voltage lines. Risk, volcanic, despite the urgency, the models come with caveats. The thermal gradients and gas emissions, while anomalous, fall short of definitive eruption precursors. The absence of seismic swarms or ground deformation tempers the alarm, but the team cannot rule out deeper processes at work. Dr. Pin Dr. Patel pushes for expanded monitoring, more temperature probes, continuous carbon dioxide sampling, and around-the-clock seismic coverage. The data so far sketches the outline of a threat, but without real-time signals, the true scale of risk remains a moving target. Uncertain. As the modeling outputs circulate among research groups and emergency planners, the debate intensifies. Some urge immediate contingency planning, citing the narrow timeframes for evacuation and airspace closure. Others caution that without direct evidence of magma movement, the region's hazard status should remain unchanged. The only certainty is that every new dataset adds urgency to the call for answers, pushing scientists to refine their models and prepare for scenarios that until now belonged strictly to the realm of theory. Urgency. Inside the emergency coordination center, the air is tense. Phones ring in rapid bursts as government officials scramble to understand the scale of what has been uncovered. At the head of a long table, emergency management director Paul Menzies addresses a cluster of aides and agency heads. There are no protocols for volcanic unrest in this region, no evacuation plans, no warning systems, not even a line in the state disaster manual about what to do if magma starts to rise beneath stable ground. Menzies reads aloud the funding request, just delivered by the Scientific Task Force, $18.2 million for continuous seismic and gas monitoring, thermal imaging, and public alert infrastructure. The number draws a sharp intake of breath from the finance minister, but the urgency in Menzies' voice leaves no room for debate. We're flying blind, he says, and every hour without data is a risk. On the other side of the city, a different kind of meeting unfolds. A mining consortium, quick to recognize the potential for rare earth deposits in volcanic systems, files a formal petition to the State Resources Board. The document, stamped and dated two days after the initial announcement, requests exclusive exploration rights across a broad swath of the mapped anomaly. The company spokesperson, Sarah Kellett, 
argues that the economic opportunity is too great to ignore. These systems can host critical minerals, lithium, cobalt, rare earths. If we don't act, another country will. Her words echo through the press, drawing sharp criticism from environmental groups and local landholders who fear unchecked exploitation of an unknown and possibly unstable landscape. The debate grows louder when the draft of a government liaison agreement surfaces. The document outlines a plan for consultation with Aboriginal custodians whose traditional lands overlap the anomaly. Elder Raymond Jara, representing the local community, stands before a panel of officials. His voice is steady but resolute. This land holds stories older than any map. No drill, no censor, no model can replace our knowledge of country. Before a single hole is dug, our people must be heard, not just consulted, but respected as decision makers. The panel listens as Jara describes the deep connection between landscape and culture, the sacred places that cannot be measured in mineral rights or hazard models. His words prompt a pause in the official proceedings, and the liaison agreement is returned for revision this time with a promise of shared authority. As the hours pass, the story spreads beyond state borders. International agencies begin to take notice. The Global Volcanic Risk Network, which tracks active and dormant systems worldwide, contacts the Australian government to request data on the anomaly. Their criteria for adding a site to the international watch list are strict. Evidence of magmatic heat, gas emissions, and potential for future activity. Australia has never before submitted a site for consideration. The Science Ministry prepares a briefing, citing the latest temperature readings, gas samples, and the outstanding questions about the chamber's origin. There is talk of designating the region as a candidate for global monitoring, a move that would bring international expertise and resources, but also new scrutiny and obligations. Pressure mounts on policymakers from every direction. Emergency planners want funding and clear authority to act. Mining interests push for rapid access to subsurface rights. Aboriginal leaders demand a seat at the decision table, not just a voice on the margins. International observers call for transparency and real-time data sharing. Each group frames the stakes in their own terms. Public safety, economic opportunity, cultural survival, scientific responsibility, the absence of a clear hazard rating leaves the region in limbo, with every new development raising the stakes for the people who live above the hidden giants. The collision of interests, values, and uncertainties forces the government to confront hard questions. These questions have no easy answers and no precedent in the country's history. Science thrives on questions that rewrite the map beneath our feet. Today, even the most stable lands can hide colossal surprises, reminding us that certainty is always provisional. As technology pushes deeper, what we accept as settled truth may shift overnight. The ground beneath us is never as quiet as we believe. What if the next discovery is right under your hometown? Share your thoughts below.